thank you for joining us today at our Lunch and Learn. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we are meeting on here today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So hello everybody, thank you for joining us again. My name is Kirsty Miller and I am DS's Head of Strategy and Growth and it's my pleasure to facilitate the panel discussion that we're having today. Uh, for those of you, Brooke, maybe you can uh, change. Yes, thank you, done that. Well done, Brooke. <laughs> for those of you who already know us at DS, uh, hello again. For those of you who are new, um, a quick introduction about who we are and what we do. Uh, so DS is a technology consulting company that builds custom software and hardware solutions for clients. We have this um, unique and broad skill set that spans data, devices, and digital, um, and that makes us the perfect choice for clients who are looking to build data-driven digital platforms, machine learning-powered products, or edge AI solutions that improve customer experiences or perhaps solve problems that haven't been solved before. So while our experience is really broad, um, I guess, you know, it's relevant today, we do have deep and specialist expertise across the data journey from strategy and architecture, right through to data engineering and pipelines, as well as turning um, data into actionable insights with machine learning and analytics. So on to today, let's uh, meet our panel. Um, so one of our panelists uh, that was advertised, Sam Sitter, he uh, is unable to make it today. He sends his apologies. But however, we've got a great group today. Um, I'd like to welcome Simon uh, Weller, who is a Senior Manager Architecture and Data Capability for the Department of Transport and Planning. Um, Kate Blank, who is the co-founder of HeapSmart and also uh, Eric Danielson, who is a principal consultant with me here at DS. Um, this is a really great group. Um, they've got a lot of experience and insights from, you know, um, I guess across enterprise, startup and government. So really looking forward to the discussion. So uh, let's get on to data activation. You can change the slide again, please, Brooke. Yeah, so maybe I'll just start with a little bit of context. Um, I think it's no secret that data is invariably in the top five priorities of probably every CIO out there. Um, you know, and the reason why that is, is the fuel that underpins the future. And um, I guess it's, you know, also everybody knows there's a bigger data load on the, on the horizon. There's, there's more and more being collected each day. But I guess uh, we all know it's not necessarily about the data itself. It's about the value that the data can live, deliver. And that's why it's such a priority um, item for almost every organization. And I guess in our experience, uh, what we encounter all the time is that many organizations are data rich, but they're insight poor. Um, you know, when we talk about having strong data foundations in place, um, it's not just about collecting it, um, you know, and privacy and in governance and storage, although those things are really, really important, but it's all about delivering data insights for things like better decision making, for new business models and, and service lines, and how do we, you know, differentiate ourselves through um, you know, better customer experiences. And I guess, you know, the other thing that we can't forget is that without the right data, it's far more challenging to leverage the power of automation and prediction through machine learning and, of course, now generative AI. So when we talk about data activation, it's useful to look at it in comparison to its opposite, dark data. So dark data, as you can see from the slide here, that's when you may be collecting and storing data, but you're not using it for any other purpose. So an example for that is, is customer support logs. You might be keeping these records and storing them of when customers contacted your business, how long the interaction was, what channel they used, but not analyzing them for any other purpose. In comparison, data activation is when you analyze this data and understand if there are patterns in the time of day that people are reaching out. Is there anything to understand from looking at the time of day and, and the channel or even the subject and the length of interaction? 
I think, you know, that's such a simple example, but we can all see how useful and actionable this type of um, information is and why this is something that a business would be wanting to prioritize. However, as we're going to uncover in this, um, in this conversation, this sometimes can be easier said than done. Um, and before I ask, <laughs> get on to the panel discussion, I also wanted you to know that we welcome questions today. We're more than happy to answer them. We encourage you to ask them in the Zoom chat box. We'll collect them um, and we will give time for questions at the end. Now, um, Brooke, I think what we wanted to do before we start is to get a sense of where the audience is at on their data activation journey. Kirsty, I think you muted yourself. Oh, yep. Sorry about that, everyone. We're going to ask the first poll. So we'll share the responses if you can just quickly uh, answer this. And Brooke, can you share the results when you're ready, when most of the people have answered? Ah, okay. That's really interesting. Um, this is actually what I would expect. And this is very consistent with what we see in as organization. Um, there's very few people I think a smaller number of people that can actually say that their data is activated. A lot of people are on the journey because they realize that this is such a priority. And yeah, a lot of people too um, have dark data. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, we might move on to the first question. Brooke, do you wanna shut the um, presentation down? And a reminder that uh, you can ask questions in the chat box. So I think the, the first question, um, we want to ask is for Kate. So hi, Kate. We know you from when DS worked at um, worked with Pivot Professional Learning. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question um, based on your former role as product manager at Pivot Professional Learning. So um, from what from what we know about the the project, one of the business drivers for replatforming your product that's what we worked on you with was access to the data. So can you share with everybody how to prioritize a, a data activation initiative in a way that aligns with overall product strategy and user needs? Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. Uh, so my data journey actually extends sort of far beyond um, the project that I worked on um, with you guys at DS. I've always been pretty lucky um, in that I've been at fairly data-centric organizations throughout my career. And so thinking about prioritizing a data activation, um, it really depends on who or what's driving it, right? So if you're an individual, which you can be, who, who has an interest in, you know, greater data-driven decision-making, or you want to use really expensive data tools like I did, um, then you can look to prioritize that by developing, you know, these questions that you want answered or hypotheses as, as I kind of like to frame them. So looking at what, you, uh, what you're what you wanting to find out and what you expect to happen, you can easy, easily align that to your product strategy. So for example, if we wanted to add more customization features uh, for users, which we did, um, then we would expect there to be a frequency of usage in our application. And then we would expect a retention year over year to increase. So a hypothesis like that would work really well, um, especially if you're just an individual who wants to, to get started on this data journey. But if you're an organization, which typically we were, and we were at Pivot, then identifying where we want to be um, and what role access to information will play in getting us closer to that. So this, this is essentially your vision and strategy to make sure that you have that in place um, sort of before you start this journey is super important. And then obviously your product strategy falls out of that. Um, so at Pivot, um, for example, um, we it's a very data-centric product. Um, our original product uh, was built to positively impact learning um, by focusing on the student-teacher relationship. So essentially, students could give teachers feedback through our application on their teaching methods, uh, and teachers could adjust uh, their practice 
um, to have a greater impact on student learning. That was our original product. Now, our vision for maximizing teacher impact um, didn't change throughout this journey, but our strategy did. So our strategy actually expanded as we were working closer with schools. We learned that we could have a greater impact on learning by providing information or data to different levels of decision makers. So that included right up to governments. We had school systems, school leaders, teachers. We were even looking at providing data to students and parents as well. So all these different decision making um, parties within, within that education system, we wanted to look at how could we actually have a greater impact by giving them information. So to do this, we obviously needed to upgrade our technology um, and unsilo our data um, is sort of the term that we were using. Um, so unsilo it and to um, and, and allow it to have more efficient aggregation levels. Um, and for that, we engaged uh, the DS team to help us sort of with that with that structure and building that database. So in summary, your data activation uh, really should align to your business vision um, and then have your strategy sort of aligned to that. And then those product decisions become pretty easy to make um, at that point. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Yeah, that's a that's good answer and good insight for anybody who's looking to do that. Um, and um, I guess you mentioned that that unsiloed, I can, and that can actually be quite a tricky um, technical challenge to solve. So I'm going to ask Simon. Um, so Simon, I know that um, the Department of Transport and Planning is in the process of centralising planning department data in a data lake to enable secure access to data internally and externally. So can you share the key technical challenges you've encountered and, and what has been most useful to help overcome these roadblocks? Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. Oh, yep, you, you muted. Um, and thanks very much for, for having me today. Um, look, the, the big challenge that we started with was the, the diversity of data that we manage. So we don't have a huge volume, we deal with fewer bigger things. Um, and we don't have a huge velocity of data, but we have a wide variety. We aggregate data from more than 80 organisations, especially all the local councils in Victoria, as well as other state departments and federal de departments, and, and creating a mechanism by which we can kind of uh, include every kind of agency from the smallest rural council to the largest federal government agencies the, uh, was, the, was the first big challenge. So creating a kind of a level playing field that um, all kinds of organisations, um, regardless of, of their digital capability and their digital maturity, um, could could participate. Um, I was lucky we started with a reasonably green field and so we could start from scratch and um, and, and build our infrastructure to suit that, that need, which was really good. The, the second challenge emerged as we went along, which was which essentially growing pains as, as we, we sort of wanted to start small with a fairly modest investment. And we wanted to um, build our capability and demonstrate value to, to obviously our executive. And um, and the challenge that emerged was as we brought on more and more and more organisations, more and more pipelines into our infrastructure, um, the manageability of the platform became an issue and we really had to double down on um, the, the kinds of disciplines that our colleagues over in software development have, um, CICD and cloud management and, you know, using... GitLab to manage the infrastructure as well as the data pipelines. Um, so this has been a huge uplift in the last um, 12 or 18 months to to kind of get our platform from a, a pretty basic early start to something that was kind of able to scale out across the whole state. That's, that's amazing. That's such a big challenge. Um, and I'm interested in hearing more later about what you've been able to do with that data, Simon. Um, I, you know, I had the pleasure of talking to Simon a little bit before this, and he's actually tackling some, um, with his department, some really interesting challenges that I think people would like to hear about. But um, I guess, you know, we've talked a little bit about the technical challenges, but it's it's not I guess, you know, just about having the right tools and the right infrastructure. Um, I think, you know, linked to a little bit about what Kate was saying is that um, there's quite a lot to do with culture. So, you know, Eric, from a consulting standpoint, uh, we talk a lot about data-driven culture. So uh, I guess, you know, I'm interested to hear from you why this is so important to data activation and what are signs of a good data-driven culture? 
And what strategies have you found effective in, in driving change towards this kind of data-driven culture? Well, Kirsty, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so one example as we're using now, for instance, the client I'm at right now is the teams, we, we've helped them introduce metrics to measure themselves and their own sort of uh, delivery capability, their own um, improvements over time. So if the, if teams, if the, if the people are on teams don't think that way about themselves, they might also think about the importance of data overall. So you might have heard of something like Dora metrics as an example, which is a way for um, teams to sort of measure how they're doing. You can measure things like how long it takes to get a new initiative, a new requirement from, from a planning stage to delivery. You can measure how long, how many incidents you have on something as a production. You can measure how long it takes you to recover from those incidents. And then you sort of use that to improve on, on how you're going over time. And the team gets used to actually looking at the data to then make decisions and to make changes to how they work. It also influences and lets them better understand how important it is to then actually keep that data so they actually, actually see. Because if you don't, if you don't keep it, if you don't think about it, you don't understand as well uh, what impact it actually can have. In terms of organization, what, what we've come across quite a bit is that yes, they might want to build something, but the first thing we try to get them to think about is what questions do you really want answered? Because you can try to push your data somewhere, uh, but if you don't have a clear idea of exactly what questions you want to answer, you might end up work doing too much or not the right type of work. You might not make the right kind of data available, and it might look like it's going to be too much work to overcome if you don't uh, sort of think about that up front. I think probably the, the first thing you should think about uh, if you plan on starting is what am I trying to achieve? What, what questions I want answered? Yeah, that's really good. And actually, we talked about this a little bit um, when we were uh, sort of getting ready for this event. And I'm going to take a little side, side trip because I feel like this concept of education and I guess really helping people to understand you know, what is actually going to make a difference and how to measure it and move move towards it. Um, there was something really interesting that came up around board education and senior executive education um, around metrics. Kate, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, it's it's really interesting because this culture piece is was such a big piece for us as well. Um, being that we were so data centric, we wanted everybody to be involved in this data journey with us. And so how we get sort of people on side, um, what Eric was saying is absolutely true. He coached me in what questions do you want answered? And um, it, it's funny because I said all of them uh, and sort of had tons and tons of um, curiosity around what we were learning. But in terms of um, taking people on that journey, um, really what I found the most effective was storytelling. Um, and so data was shouldn't really be used for a sort of an assessment of how well your application is doing. Um, these are not results. These are these are little traces of information that you need to piece together into that story. Um, and so how you present that data to different levels of stakeholders is really important. So looking at um, sort of the objectives of your board and, and sort of what they're looking to see is happening, um, really having those questions um, in mind from the outset and then showing um, you know, the data that comes out of that um, as sort of proof of here's, here's here we are, here's where we are on that journey, um, rather than here are the results, we failed or we succeeded. I think mm -hmm. that's really important for a board level, but also for, for everyone within the organization is to say, you know, here's what we're learning along the way. Here's what, here's how I would interpret that. How would you interpret that? And sort of invite people into that conversation and develop those stories together because, in an organization, everyone has bits and pieces of that of information that you piece together. Um, and that way you sort of, that's really, in my mind, data activation. It's it's starting those conversations, getting all the bits of information together. So so my advice for that is, is don't present these as, as results. Um, they're not. Um, present them as, you know, this story. And that's really um, sort of how we how we managed to be so effective um, at Pivot in that. 
Awesome. Yeah, really, really good point. And um, I, I guess I'd like to ask, follow on and ask Simon, um, you know, you've got this, this big 12, 18 month project, which is still going, you know, and um, is highly necessary to, I guess, activating the data. Um, from a government perspective, is there any, I guess, differences in, in sort of how you would approach it, you know, after listening to Eric and Kate? Um, no, I think it's very similar. I think we, I, I've, I think I've seen a tipping point in the last two or three years from um, perhaps a lack of awareness of what's possible with data to to a real hunger for data. And mm. so and so we've sort of kind of crossed this bridge from we can now get this data from um, a whole range of systems. We can supply it to you um, to, to now our our executive is, is really hungry for data. And probably we're now in a place where we're managing expectations as to what is and isn't possible with with the data we've got, um, given we're wrangling so many data sources. Um, and so I think, you know, in government, we sort of get um, we've had the lecture on the importance of privacy and we've had the lecture on the importance of cybersecurity. Those things are, are really well embedded in our culture. Um, having having the conversation about um, sharing the data and how do we share the data with um, with all of the right kind of controls in place, but ensuring that our stakeholders are involved in in the conversation and the story. I, I think the story um, the story based aspect that Kate talked about. I think we're we've still got a little road to hoe on that. We do we do some of that um, in terms of some of the wider narratives around how the population of Victoria is evolving or or how services um, are or aren't meeting the needs of the community. But I think I think we've got a way to go in terms of that. Mm, awesome. Yeah, great points. Um, you mentioned <laughs> security and governance and, you know, privacy, like that's such an important part of data activation and such a key part of every time we, we talk about this subject. So maybe, um, Kate, I might ask you, so as a pro product manager, how do you ensure that, you know, data is secure, but that privacy is not acting as a blocker? to the product roadmap and releases. It's um it's but it's funny that that these these two are often paired together. Um security and privacy are, are you know usually lumped together into one big bucket of of stress, I like to call it. Um and they are <laughs> both very stressful, especially especially when you're considering um your product and and majority of our business at the time um being an ed tech, a very small ed tech. Um you know those all those things together um, our product was our business and so, and our data was our product. And so making sure that um, we had uh, secure data was of the utmost importance, um, but also the privacy of our data was our reputation and our brand reputation and brand promise to our customers, which were our teachers and our students, right? Um, so I don't like to to lump them together. Um, you know, in terms of security, I, I kind of will, I'll handball that over to Eric um, after I sort of speak on privacy. But I think that, um, you know, it's really important, especially in a small organization, that it's not just one person responsible for data. Um, at Pivot, we we established um, a team-based, uh, you know, kind of govern governance of our data. And we had all those different perspectives. So we had the technical side, we had the customer value side, which I brought to, to that sort of team, but we also had the business side. So how are we sort of activating each of those different perspectives um, and putting that into a bit of a strategy that we can all work uh, towards. Um, so all of that was done sort of together. And I think that was really important for us. Um, in terms of not allowing security and privacy me measures to act as a blocker, I think the important thing to, to recognize is that they will be. Um, they will be a blocker to release. Um, and that was really our hard line um, at Pivot. If something was not ready, um, particularly if it was a data risk, that we would not release it. And so they did act as blockers. Um, but over time, um, you know, working with our technical team, um, particularly from the product um, and the dev and the QA side, the three, three sort of teams working together, we recognized that our process needed to change. Um, and so we had flags in place when we did um, sort of those refinement, those sprint refinements and sprint planning. Um, and then we made sure that we continued to talk about those particular features as they were coming up to, um, to delivery so that we weren't sort of blocked in that way. So our process has changed. Um, and I think that worked well so that, you know, things, um, you know, weren't as, you know, weren't um, delaying releases into the future. But yeah, I think it's important to recognize they will. 
um, and they should. Uh, you should never release something if it's not if it's not ready or if it's a data risk. So, um, so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's good. And I will now throw over to Eric to talk <laughs> about security. Yeah. Eric, if you will. Yeah, I think uh, the the core principle, and there's there's probably some some good knowledge around this subject in general. But the core principle was to try to split the identifying information about any individual from any other data. So. They're completely separate records and ideally kept separately so that you can't get a full picture by just looking in one place. It, it sounds simple maybe, but it, you might imagine that you have someone's name and a lot of sort of key identifying information in one place and then anything else that might be classifying like their gender, their age. You might not store their date of birth, but you might store their age, for instance, separately um, so that you don't when you're querying for data you can be pretty sure that if you just avoid some of this like say they identify the table with identifying information you'll accidentally pull in stuff you shouldn't that's uh, that's one one technique um ooh. go still, for it no no still talking uh, the other one is around like uh, well me, as an engineer, I actually find it easier to work with cloud platforms compared to on-premise because I feel like yeah, I have a lot of fine-grained controls that I can use in, uh, say, in uh, in a Google platform, in Amazon, or in Azure, that let me control both sort of, sort of physical or semi-physical like, uh, from networking perspective, but also from sort of user access uh, well, if they have access to services within the cloud platform, but to a much greater level than I have with, say, an on-premises solution, uh, at least, at least from my perspective, um, I understand it better because I can see it all that way. And also, when it comes to privacy, the cloud providers will be able to tell you which services uses data uh, stored that is actually on. Uh, they call it. Is it hosted in Australia, for instance, as an example? Because some some data, there's particular legislation that says that you cannot have this data transferred out of the country. Uh, and so you need to make sure that you don't, for instance, have a hosting provider that sits in a different country or the, the data store is in a different country. And the, um, the cloud provider, if you build your own solution, can help you with that. Whereas if you use a SaaS solution, then you have to be really careful because you don't, they might not even want to tell you, or if they do, it's sort of, it's not in your control. It's not in your hands. So you're letting go a bit more of control if you go that route. Yeah, that's right. And it's data sovereignty you were looking for, Eric. Oh, never... sorry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you never remember it when you need it. Um, yeah, that's that's a really, 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 really good point. Um, it is, it is, um, it is easier if you can see all of those controls, and that's a couple of good technical tips and perspectives there. Um, I'm Simon. You started talking about security, so I'm going to security and governance. I'm going to return to you. So I can imagine that there are, you know, a lot of policy um, and technical controls, as you already mentioned. Um, are there any, you know, special things that um, that you have to do at the Department of Transport and Planning um, to make sure that you're meeting more stringent guidelines? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the Victorian state government has um, has protocols, VPDSS, I'm not sure what they stand for, Victorian Protective Data Security something, um, a whole litany of um, standards that we have to meet um, and attest to um, every year that we're meeting. Um, and so, and so I think, um, I think, you know, the things that Eric said are really spot on, like, like actually embedding in your infrastructure that you're separating out the personally identifiable information um, from all of your other data and, and ensuring you've got separate security protocols around those um, and separate processes around those. Um, and, and as Kate said, like this is a huge hindrance to kind of integrating data and having, um, having government as a whole kind of acting as a whole um, these these barriers do exist. 
Um, and I think I think a, a good place to start is, is where Kate started on on strategy. If you can articulate that the reason you need to bring data together is is to deliver a more effective service or a more effectively deliver infrastructure into the Victorian community as we do, then um, then if you can sort of articulate that strategic outcome, you can kind of get across some of these barriers. Some of it's also about reducing hurdles. I, I sort of think of reducing the technical hurdles by having security protocols put in place that make it easy to securely share data um, is part of it. But then we also have to um, reduce bureaucratic um, bureaucratic hurdles. And so I sort of picture sharing data as being similar to um, getting a purchase order signed off. You're going to release money. You're going to release data. You need to have a nice, simple process that everybody's familiar with. That you know Everybody knows you go and get the right signatures and then you can go and get the purchase order signed. Do the same thing with data sharing and then we can kind of have the checks and balances in place, but more effectively share information. Yeah, nice. Yes, that's a very good analogy. Um, okay, um, I, I guess it's time for us to ask another audience poll. I mean, we've been talking about challenges in activating data, so we, we thought it'd be good to ask the audience, what, what is your top challenge to activating data in your organisation? Thanks, Brooke. And again, we'll just give people a few minutes to answer um, and then we'll share the results. Well, maybe not a few minutes, that's a bit too long. Maybe a few seconds. Brooke will share once the majority of people have answered. I feel like we need to have on hold music or something for this part of the session. Brooke, are you able to share? Thank you. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? The lowest one is data governance and privacy. I wonder. Yeah, and a lot of upfront um, strategic vision and mindset as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really interesting. I hope you guys found it as interesting as us. I can see everybody's looking at it. Right, now um, we'll move on um, and we'll, we'll go back to you, Simon, um, because I guess we, we talk about all of, these, uh, all of these different things, but at the end of the day, um, people wanna know how much it's gonna cost. Um, it's something, you know, the cost of databasation, data exploitation is something that, that always comes up um, so, and I imagine, you know, you're 12 to 18 months down this, in this big project. Um, so how do you, how do you manage ongoing operational costs as the amount of data collected continues to rise? Yeah, good question. I think, I think um, visibility is really key and, and Eric mentioned, you know, cloud services offer some of this. And so being able to actually see where all your money is going um, and look at what um, services in your, in your cloud stack are, are starting to cost more and more um, is, is extremely helpful. Um, and I also think it's, you know, because cloud services offer such a smorgasbord of different um, services, you've got different ways of doing things, different ways of um, cutting your cloth. Um, you know, one of the things we started out with, um, you know, this you know point point and click services in the cloud that often have a whole cluster of PySpark services sitting underneath, and so you kind of click, I'll have one of those, and boom, you've got this high cost infrastructure sitting underneath. Um, and so we've had to rework some of our pipelines and keep on top of some of our pipelines that are starting to cost. Um, storage costs also creep up and up and up and up. Um, and so that's something that, um, that we're watching quite closely because obviously you accumulate more and more data and then that just cost just bubbles up and up and up. Um, so we're starting to look at things like lower cost offloading historic data to lower cost infrastructure. Uh, we're on Amazon, so so looking at um, glacier type things, and 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 binding that to our disaster recovery kind of mindset as well, because because we started small and grew bit by bit, you know we've probably crossed a line where our services are now mission critical, and and we need to and that will drive cost. But if we can start looking at um, combining um, the concept of offloading data to a separate data center with a disaster recovery strategy, um, we can sort of you know, kill two birds with one stone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 
And I guess, um, you know, that's connected to another really important point when we talk about data activation. Like it's not just about cost, but you talked about, um, you know, becoming mission critical now, which is which is great. <laughs> but um, I guess, uh, you know, data activation can be such a massive undertaking for an organization. So Eric, I I'd like to ask you, how can you improve speed to value without under or over investing? Yeah, I'll just come back to the first thing I said, which is if you know what questions you want answered, then start small, I think. Try to find a couple of questions you want answered uh, and then focus on what do you need to answer those? Can I sort of get, assuming that you have some kind of transactional data system, some applications you're using which, which holds, holds that data in the first place, just try to get it out. And I wouldn't necessarily go try to come up with a, or a sort of perfect engineered solution to begin with. I just even treat it as a spike, treat it as an experiment, just get the data out in some way, even if that is some massive query that runs at night as one off to dump it to a file, whatever it is, uh, and get that into some kind of storage. I would say what I found, what we found really good was um, using Amazon's S3 and Athena, because it, you can really do something pretty quickly, pretty cheap to just play and see what you can get out of it. So if you can get the data out and dump it in S3, which is relatively cheap storage, and then use Athena, which is a tool that lets you query the data straight out of S3, S files. You don't even necessarily need to transform them if they have a sort of a, a reasonably neat structure to it. Um, then you can combine data from multiple sources that way. You can export files from different systems and use the team to query across them, as long as there's some kind of common identifiers. That's a cheap way just to see, do I, am I able to answer this question with the data I have? Is there something missing? Um, and if you, if you start saying, uh, yeah, you're happy with what you can see, then maybe you start formalizing it. Maybe you start building this as something that can be pro productionalized, but you don't have to start big necessarily. I would say start with some experiments and see if you get your questions answered before you go too far. Thanks. It's an agile methodology, an agile mindset, yeah. so iterate and, and improve. Yeah, that's right. And that's really interesting because I was talking to someone about machine learning the other day. And I think a lot of people think that um, machine learning is quite different to what we're talking about here, but it's exactly the same. Like when you first start doing it, you'll have a bunch of data and you have the data scientists and they'll wrangle it in a uh, Jupyter no notebook. Who cares, you know? But once you start getting results and that's when you start investing in automated pipelines and all of that, that um, you know, other stuff. Um, okay, great. Uh, so that's, that's some technical advice from you, uh, Eric. What about um, from a product um, advice, Kate? Yeah, it's it's really funny because, you know, Eric and I, you know, obviously work together um, and mine melded on, on lots of things. But I think that I'll come back to sort of what he was saying around what questions do you want answered? Um, I think that's the important thing um, to get started. Um, so pick one, um, one question, and you can fairly easily pull together information, Ooh, gone dark in my room, sorry. Um, you could quite easily pull together information because data is information. And I think that's uh, the easiest way, I, you know, I can explain it to someone um, from a non-technical, non-data background is, you know, what information do you need? Um, what information will be helpful? Um, and so doing, you know, small things like pulling information or feedback out of your CRM, presenting that um, to a group of people and starting a conversation that is activating your data. And that's it's, it can be as simple as that. And from that, those conversations really get started and people start to ask more questions. You can capture those questions. You can then prioritize those questions. And then you can start to get into, you know, do we need a more complex system? Um, and so that's really, you know, a, a nice easy way to get started um, is, you know, just pull information out of whatever system you've got and, you know, whatever amount of information you have, um, and start that conversation um, because it's really um, amazing when you put something in front of somebody, as Eric was saying as well, um, you know, when you put this information in front of people, people then all of a sudden have more questions um, mm. and then it kind of can spiral and, and can become a little bit more um, complex after that. So um, just be curious and, and, and pull together the questions you want answered. Yeah, awesome. And um, Simon, I wanted to go to you. 
um, this start small, um, I guess, message is something that you've already kind of spoken about in one of the answers to your questions. Um, did you have, I guess, you know, any other um, learnings about not over or under investing from, from your long journey? I, I note with interest that you created a, a hunger for data in your executives. <laughs> How did this happen? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I, I think once once our executives understood that they, you know, could could really get their finger on the pulse of what's actually happening, I think they they understood the need for engaging with data and, and sort of taking up the mantle of data owner, as we call them in governance circles. One of the um, one of the questions I've been wrestling with is when and if do I invest in in, in a large data warehouse type um infrastructure, uh, a Databricks or a Snowflake or a Redshift or in, any of those kind of um, technologies. And I've, I've, I have sort of keep kicking it down the down the road because I've done exactly what Eric said. I've started with Athena and S3 and I've started delivering value to to my customers. Um, and, and so I'm still wondering when do I need to drop the money on, on a large infrastructure like that because um, – I haven't hit that use case yet where I can't deliver what the business wants with um, with that kind of infrastructure. Yeah, that's that's a good takeaway, right? So, you know, really think about your ability to deliver what the business needs um, in terms of, you know, um, helping you make decisions about investment. I think that's a really, really good takeaway. Okay, well, sure. yeah, so Eric, yes, please. There's just one more thing I wanted to say. So that is... Uh, also something to keep in mind, especially if you rely a lot on off the shelf products or you use SaaS platforms, when you're in your selection process, when you're trying to work out what tools to use, make sure that they make it easy for you to get access to the data because that's another one. So it's easier to focus on the functionality they have to offer, but if it's hard to access it, um, then you're causing yourself pain down the road, basically. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, okay, before we get to questions, um, I wanted to ask everybody the same question, same last question. Um, you know, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Kate. So based on your experience, what's the best piece of advice you'd offer to someone charged with activating data in their organization? I have um I have three that I've I've combined into into one small statement <laughs> because I couldn't kind of I couldn't figure one piece of advice but I think it's there's a theme sort of running through um you know Simon's responses to Eric's responses through this whole thing is start small um and you don't need to invest a lot of money just to get started um because every organization has you know pieces of information they can pull together um, you know, be driven by curiosity. That's that, you know, what questions do you want answered? What do you want to know? What's going to help you sort of move to the next level? Um, and there's this thing that I like to, to reiterate in my own mind um, over and over is focus on what's important and not just what's interesting. Because as a product person, I find lots and lots of things interesting. There's lots of data that's really interesting that you can focus on. But, you know, when you have limited resources in a small team and you're trying to get to that providing value, you really need to focus on what's important. So what, you know, really hone in on what questions you need answered and what you think it's what's going to come out of knowing the answer to that question. Um, and that's really sort of an important sort of way to think about um, getting started, especially if you don't have a ton of money, which, you know, none of us do. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Thank you, Kate. Um, what about you, Simon? What advice would you offer? I think, um, you know, I think most organisations probably understand at some level that they need to be getting more value from data, uh, which means I think you can be a victim of your own success. And so, and so I think planning ahead to some of the, you know, going back to that growing pains point that I made that, you know, you don't want to have to rework too much of what you've done because you sort of reached a point where, um, you know, you, you, you need better management practices or you need, you know, tighter controls over your cloud environment or you need better, you know, cost control measures. Um, you need to sort of be thinking ahead to those things. You don't necessarily have to implement them straight away, but you kind of need to know that you, you, you're, you're likely to succeed and you're likely to need those things down the line. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, definitely. You need to you need to be thinking ahead and you need to ensure that you're going to be scalable. 
Um, lastly, Eric, what about you? Two, two things. Uh, first one is make sure teams have a, or the organization has a strategy for how you plan on making data available. One of the things you see a lot, for instance, is TED tackles, meaning you have some kind of reporting system that that, that pokes straight into transactional systems to retrieve data. Uh, and that can happen during a busy business hour. Say for instance, you've got a uh, analytic system and you've got the sales system and the analytic system, someone's running some heavy queries that go straight into the sales system and it actually impacts the performance of the, the sales system because the database is busy responding to the analytics queries. So I guess, try to make sure that there's a uh, some kind of plan that means that the teams who are responsible for the system makes data available without impacting transactional systems. Uh, and the other one, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, is yes, try to avoid losing data along the way. So um, in a traditional sort of um, relational database system, you really mostly see the current state of everything. You update a record if something changes, and if you're, if you're querying it, you see what it looks like right now. But you often also want to see what's happened over time. And if you structure the data that way, you, you can't. You can really only see what it's like right now. You have a couple of options. One of them would be to have your systems emit changes when it happens as events. So that in some way, of shape or form, say, OK, there's been an update to it to a record, it's been up to, to an order, whatever it might be, I'm going to publish that information so someone else can actually uh, use that. Or, as we've done as well, is instead of updating records, create new versions, version everything. So I might have a person in a record that has been updated a few times, person's moved house, they might have done something else, who knows. But instead of updating it, I just create a new version. And the, the highest version is always the current version. So I never lose anything. It helps not just with analytics, but also when I'm inspecting for, uh, say, a, uh, an issue, uh, a defect in application. Uh, just in general, you'd be surprised at how important it is to not throw them something away. Well, that's good advice. Yeah, I can see how that would be really useful. Thank you, Eric. Um, okay, so we've reached the end of our panel discussion. Don't forget you can still ask questions. Um, just pop them in the chat. We've got a couple of questions to uh, answer, but before we do, we wanted to do just one last poll uh, to kind of get a gauge on what everyone's thinking about, uh, you know, data activation, what the benefits are. Brooke, can you run the last poll? Yeah. We'll just get the results of that shared and we'll move on to the, the questions that we've got. Yep, there we go. Nice. Providing data as a product was one of the most popular. I think that was about what I would expect. I hope everyone else found it as useful, but yeah, data as a product is something we hear a lot about. Um, certainly that's what Simon's doing in um, the project that he's working on. Great, thanks for sharing everybody. That was really useful. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of questions here. Um, the first question I feel a lot of empathy with, I'm gonna, I'm going to ask, I think I'll ask Eric first, um, and then, you know, Kate and Simon, please jump in. So the question is, how can you motivate other people who are employed to understand the importance of data integrity and why it's so instrumental to ensure that all data and correct data is inputted? They've added, we struggle with employees not entering or updating the data. And, you know, everyone who has a CRM system and works with people in sales, I feel you. Eric, what do you, what have you got? Well, I've been on the receiving end of it. Uh, in terms of how to motivate people, uh, I don't have any good. Uh, I, I can tell the stories of what I've seen, but in terms of um, 
<laughs> yeah, for instance, yeah, people people have all sorts of business ideas. But if yeah, if your data's not in good shape, uh, not much you can do to deliver it. I, I don't have any. Unfortunately, I don't have anything good at the top of my head. Yeah, I've, I've got one example because I think you sort of jolted my memory with the CRM example <laughs> because that that's typically the one you right because like everybody's yeah. sort of moving along and you know how do you get accurate data in your CRM um, which is such an important system for lots of other teams to get insight out of um, something that that worked for us at the time was involving those who were inputting into that system into where that information flows through to um, you know, a really small example was having some of our customer support people join um, our technical discussions around potential tickets that had been loaded into that system. And, you know, we showed them the process of us opening that ticket, us trying to get context of what was happening. Um, and, and we showed them in live terms what questions we were asking, you know, what information was potentially missing, um, you know, did they verify that information? And they saw how the decision-making process ran. And if the information coming through that ticketing system was accurate and complete and, and all there, that whole, um, that the technical solution and getting that ticket addressed became much faster. And then they saw that that impacted them going back to that customer and giving them a great result and, and a faster result. And so we we found that that worked quite well in, in a number of scenarios where we showed the impact of that information being used in other parts of the business, um, as particularly in reporting um, and other and product development and other things like that. So, you know, it, it is it is challenging, um, but you know, as much as possible, show how that information is being used and the impact of that information can help. Um, but also, you know, data governance and cleaning data is is a real thing. So. <laughs> That's an excellent example, and I'm going to take right down that tip myself. <laughs> I do have one now, if, you, if you're okay yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so I guess one thing you could do uh, to, to not make this about individuals is to set up some team-based OKRs to say, well, what are we trying to achieve overall? So, mm -hmm. for instance, if you're trying to see what ratio of our data records are actually in a good shape, and then that is, becomes a team focus for a, a time period to improve on that, not about the individual, but the whole, and explaining why. It, I guess that's the other thing you need to explain why, but trying to set goals that the team can get behind and maybe let the team work out how they can get there. And hopefully they'll get, they'll come to the conclusion that they have to be more careful when they enter the dot in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's another good suggestion too. Um, anything else to add on that panel? Otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to the... Oh, I think there's a couple of things. I think executive sponsorship helps an enormous amount. I, I think if staff suspect that the data they're entering isn't going anywhere and isn't being read by anyone, then their interest in filling it in sort of wanes. But as soon as they understand that the executive is going to put it on a dashboard and take that dashboard to the intergovernmental committee, then okay. suddenly the... um you know, the light bulb goes off that that's really important data that they're filling in. I, I think the other thing that I'm kind of exploring at the moment is feedback loops, actually actually creating kind of visibility of here's the data we've collected and here's the missing data. Here's the data we've collected and these ones can't possibly be right. Um, and sort of feeding that back to wherever the data is coming from so that um, the people providing it have visibility of um, where the gaps are. Yeah, that's awesome. That feedback loop is a really, really good suggestion. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much, panel. This was good stuff. I hope we have answered your audience question, whoever answered that question, asked that question. Um, the second question we've got is, um, has anyone come up against legislation prohibiting moving from data silos to connected data source? So this is, you know, I don't know, data sovereignty comes into play here. Um, I'm not sure, but, uh, has any, has anybody come up with like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is lived experience um, okay. in okay. government. Um, so al almost everyone has a clause in their legislation that they think means they can't share data. And some of it's real and we what you'd expect. For example, it's hard to get to health data. It's hard to get to data out of courts, for example. It's um, 
um, the Victorian privacy principles, for example, prevent certain personal identifiers from crossing state borders. Um, having said that, oftentimes I find lawyers will have a why can't we kind of position rather than a how can we position. And, and so when you start actually looking at the legislation and looking specifically what it says and what the intent is, it doesn't necessarily prevent you from sharing data. It just puts caveats around how you do it. And so it makes it a more complicated and long-winded conversation, but you can usually get there. Um, but you, you are uncovering, yeah, there, there are restrictions in some cases for right reasons, usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, definitely, particularly health and all of the ones that you mentioned. Okay, that was an interesting answer. Thank you, Simon. Well, we're just about at time. Um, so I'm going to close the session now. I'm going to thank everybody on the call. Thank you for having uh, a lunch and learn session with us. And thank you to our amazing panelists who have been so interesting um, to chat with us and share their experiences. Um, I've really got a lot out of this session and I, I hope everyone who joined has too. So thank you very much, panellists. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us and I hope you have a lovely afternoon. We'll see you at the next one.